Good evening, everybody. This is Pete Morris. We're uh, doing the Comanche Zoom here for Thursday night, March 11th. Here's the topic. Uh, Will uh, Carpenter is coming back to finish, uh, to do more about his uh, engine out that he did uh, in, down in the Carolinas. And this one is kind of interesting because it's uh, going through all of the choices he made in deciding to rebuild and or repair the, the Comanche that pretty much got destroyed when it was recovered as opposed to when it landed. And we're gonna have some fun with this one. So hold on to your hat. And now we'll do the, uh, the old uh, who you are, where you are, and what you fly kind of stuff. Chance to get it to chit chat. You can all unmute yourself and talk as, at will. I never got muted. Nope, you didn't. <laughs> You're well behaved. <laughs> well, I'm in Western Massachusetts, George Merriam. Um, I've been flying for 55 years, started in uh, 65. Um, and I got my twin Comanche uh, or my uh, multi engine rating in a uh, PA 30. In, hi, CJ. Um, in, a, um, what was it? Tim's Air Park, north of Austin, Texas. I don't even think that uh, airport's there anymore. Uh, there's an airport down there that'll uh, be open forever. It's called Georgetown, but uh, this one was called Tim's Air Park. And I got that rating in, I want to say 69. May have been 68, I think, 1968. Well, I'm Pete Morris. I'm located in Danielson, Connecticut. I fly a Comanche 63 uh, 250, which uh, I dearly love. I had a, two, a 1960 250 with no autopilot. This one has an autopilot, and I am definitely spoiled. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, if you're going to file um, single engine uh, instruments, you can't beat that autopilot. Just to hold on so you can do your planning. Well, I, I put in a lot of hours with my other Comanche without the autopilot. Oh man! And my left time, my left arm got pretty good. <laughs> Wonder, I think you guys have to do those tricks that we did. Audio's that was broken and unreadable. Uh, Try again. Audio's not so good. Apparently, it's you know DoD worldwide. Ernie, I think you might have an open mic. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, like Pete, um, because our autopilot is partially operable, <laughs> um, I've got uh, dad and I have a lot of time flying uh, without a fully capable autopilot. And I am so excited to be flying with one, hopefully in a month or so. Going to California to get it? Well, yes. Yeah, so the latest on the Trio Pro Pilot, if anybody's interested. So you probably all saw that uh, Genesis has formally announced that the S-Tech 3100 is available for all singles. And uh, that means the Group I Special is over. But it, I've confirmed with them that the upgrade price, which is basically half price and includes brand new or factory remand servos if you've already got and installed anything and then if you've got a single axis variant like a 2040 then it's about uh about 60 percent off and again includes those factory remand servos and a warranty um that remains and then the twins will get the group buy special if they weigh in and sign up and we just need three more twins and then the twin project for the genesis s tech 3100 will continue the Trio Pro Pilot, um, which is the uh, going to be the least expensive one to install, and which is a very capable GPS-driven autopilot, and you don't even have to have the GPS uh, installed if you just want an autopilot to be your wings leveler and fly like you know the heading you put in. It'll work just fine like that. Um, that the the uh, I just, I literally just got the latest because Sean's airplane is out there being a test airplane. 
and the drawings are done, the uh, servo brackets are going to be are, are on their way out to be test installed in three different Comanches just to verify that the fact that our airplanes were hand assembled is not going to interfere with the universal install and um, expecting to be flying her home in time for, uh, for her to show the thing off at uh, Comanche Town Sun and Fun in April. Not saying they're going to be shipping or even approved because that's up to the FAA, but the work will be done. Pretty exciting. You saw the test flight track for the Trio Pro Pilot, right? For anybody coming to Comanche Town in April, um, there's a new, for those whose camping days are behind them, uh, there is a group by special that got negotiated today on a hotel. It's not right close to Sun and Fun because those hotels are very expensive, but it's 80 something bucks a night, 93 with taxes and fees includes breakfast. And uh, as long as there's a group that are kind of carpooling to the field together, for those whose camping days are behind them, it should be a pretty great way to, to be at the show and not spend a bunch and to get to be with your Comanche pilots on the way up and down. I just had the um, U.S. government retract my travel um, exemption. No, <laughs> I'm so uh, sorry. They changed the rules um, last on over the weekend, and my application was finalized on the Friday afternoon when they got in. The, so they they sent me the confirmation on the Friday afternoon saying I could travel. Spent almost two thousand pounds getting all the flights and everything sorted. Monday morning they called and said actually we've made a mistake. Rules actually. Um, the document says the rules changed on Friday, not on Monday. So you, we, your exemption's been cancelled, and there's nothing you can do and hung up on me. So that meant I oh, literally Adam. lost quite a lot of another about two thousand pounds lost <laughs> trying to do this kind of stuff. No, so that's um, not fun. <laughs> you know what? When we talk afterwards, Adam, I have three and a half million miles just with American, about four and a half million commercial air miles. Let's talk. I, mm. There may be a way to get that money refunded to you or at least made permanently reusable. So um, British, we'll Airways, British Airways have been quite reasonable and said that I can have the flight moved to whenever I need to in the next two years. OK, but it's not okay. that. That's not the concern. It's the concern is the hotel that won't refund because it's short notice and they've literally just been like, well, we can't, you know, they can't expect to do that. Um, and look at a lot of the other stuff we, we had planned as well. So. Oh, man. Is that the hotel for Comanche? There for um, Comanche no, Town? No, the hotel in Arkansas where I was staying. Got it. So that is unreasonable. I, I was going to camp at well. Comanche Town. <laughs> Good. Many of us uh, will be. Well, I might. We might have had a bonanza, so I was going to turn up in a full mask and hazmat suit and kind of hide myself and park the bonanza right at the back. <laughs> uh, well, as long as we're talking bonanzas, the bonanza that came in and uh, put on like dark glasses to Comanche Town and named itself Comanche 402 is wondering if uh, we might have space to park it again in Comanche Town. So wow. Pete, you're on notice. <laughs> yeah. And Pat Donovan when he comes in. Well, yeah, so that's some, that's some sad news. I was really excited to get to finally meet everybody and be at Sun and Fun, and, and, but uh, I can't control the American government, so. Adam, I don't think they finished building the wall on us. That's yeah. Um, the, the one we have one idea that might work is to fly to Bermuda, wait in Bermuda for 14 days, and then fly on to to the US, which would be allowed. Uh, however, that would be another about a thousand, thousand five hundred pounds just to sit in Bermuda for two weeks while we wait to travel. So, although a nice Caribbean holiday wouldn't go too, wouldn't go far, but then the British government is banned travel for it's illegal to travel for a vacation at the moment. So. If I try and travel for that, then I might get arrested. So the world has just gone crazy. Um, for what it's worth, uh, there is some discussion going on right now amongst pilots attending Comanche Town about a flight to the Bahamas afterwards. Uh, and the Bahamas obviously include British as well as American um, islands. So maybe <laughs> look at those. Oh, could you send me, if there is a discussion about that, could you send me a link to, to any information about that? Because I do really want to make sure I can I try and make it. 
I can't because it's not a discussion I can send a link to, but I can keep you posted. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Comanche Zoom number. I think this might be 51 or 52. Uh, just uh, jump into any quiet spot and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. And I'm CJ Stump from uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, although right now my where I'm flying from is going to be Oxnard, California. Comanche 180. Miller Eisel from Mitchellville, Maryland, 4-5 Papa. Miller Eisel, welcome. And you, if I recall, are a really gorgeous 260C. Uh, yeah, it's cooling its wings now. And I hope to get it up in a couple of weeks. Outstanding. Well, welcome and thanks for being with us this evening. <clears throat> Anybody else jump into a quiet spot, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Don Steve Putter. Schilling. From uh, Charlie 77 near Rockford, Illinois, at PA 30 Twin Comanche. John, did you say Dave Schilling? Pardon me? Is that Dave Schilling and iPad too? No, it's Steve. Yeah, it's Steve Schilling. I can't get my uh, video going here. Ah, Steve Schilling. Well, if it's all right with you, uh, Pete Morse might your iPad too to be Steve Schilling. And welcome, and thanks for joining us. Nice on footer, you. orange mass, 9317 Papa, 260C. The C's are well represented. Welcome, John. Good to see your face. <clears throat> Rich Bergman, uh, El Cajon area, Southern California, 250 or 260B, uh, 9242 Papa. Rich, it is a pleasure to see you as always. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. If this works. Loud and clear. CJ, this is Alan Cheek uh, down in Peachtree City. I don't know if I got a picture on. Anyway, 63 Comanche 250 um, with about 40 hours left on a gear AD. <laughs> but I Alan. will make, I will make uh, Comanche town. Outstanding. And you have discovered that you can get a at cost 1000 hour gear AD DVD from Hans Newbert or not? Because if not as a you public know, service announcement. We have that in kind of one of my drawers in my credenza. So, so um, yeah, I got to kind of dig that thing out. But like I say, um, you know, I was working with a friend of mine on his uh, 59, just teaching him to fly it and stuff. And then we just, we finally got his airplane out to Webco yesterday uh, because of all the weather uh, for the last month or so you know in the freezing temperatures and stuff so um i was gonna ferry it for him and then at the last minute he ended up catching covid so uh anyways i sat there and said you know um, i really don't probably don't need to meet up with you to swap log books and get keys and and he ended up in the hospital uh actually our local hospital because he lives in auburn and was feeling like crap and i I said, you know, it was a 90 minute, 90 minute drive. And I said, you know, I guess our hospital's got great protocols from what I've heard, but uh, I'd drive your fanny up here and get, check yourself in. And he did that anyway. So um, he's all better. He's just kind of got a hacky cough. But so finally he's got another Auburn friend of his that was able to ferry it out to Newton, uh, I guess Monday. Uh, or so. Anyway, interesting. We were watching them on four flight. The winds were one eight zero at twenty five gust of thirty two. So uh, anyway, I'm sure he had a sporty landing. <laughs> anyway, I'm just glad to hear that he's doing better. Um, we want to keep all of our Comanche owners and operators and drivers as healthy and happy as possible. So Absolutely. welcome, Absolutely. Alan. Good to see you. Yep. Hey, CJ, Rick Foster here. 
of North Carolina, fly a 260C turbo and a nice, sweet little running 180 Comanche. Rick Foster, you got that nicely bracketed. Welcome and thank you for being here and thank you for keeping two such beautiful birds going. You are one of how many turbo C's, Rick? Uh, 29 to 39, I've heard different numbers. And uh, did you do factory turbo or were you one of the few that did the conversion? No, it's a factory turbo. It came out of the, came out of the factory and uh, pretty recently overhauled, 300 hours since overhaul. And, it's it's really sweet. I, I just don't hadn't had a chance to make as many long trips so I could get up in the in the mid ranges yet. But uh, but I've enjoyed it. Welcome and thanks for being here with us. And while we're doing C models, I'm going to see if uh, Bill Kniff is there. If we can tap him to chime in. Not turbo, mind you. And uh, Eric Jones, I'll text him to see if he can oh, come in tonight. I like it. where are you? <clears throat> Where are you based? Oh, Hickory, North Carolina. Where? Hickory, North Carolina, kind of near Charlotte, North Carolina. Do you know where Newburn is? Absolutely. Okay, well, you're welcome. I, uh, in fact, I've been meaning to fly down there, uh, so I may give you a call. I go, go that way almost weekly. Very well, if you get down here, I know, the, I know where the coffee's good. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks. We'll get together. Okay. <clears throat> I love this. Two C drivers from not too far apart in North Carolina. I had no idea. Well, Rick, I look forward to seeing you because I think that on the C model, I, I really need some more ins more ideas about it. Sure. I'd love to. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll give you a call. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'll, 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 get, I'll give you my telephone number, but I'll, I'll through the network. Very good. Very good. Thank you. My pleasure. And everybody jump in to any quiet spot. Say who you are, where you are, and what you fly, and welcome. Just curious if, if a Turbo C has ever challenged the 400. The, uh, the book says the 400 is just a little bit faster, uh, but you know, it's 17,000 and uh, it's 27 and 27 inches. It, it, it's 247 statute miles per hour, I think. But, it, but it's, easy, it's easy to cruise in at eight or 10,000 at 175 knots with a little bit of boost and about 14 gallons an hour. And your overhauls are better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I had a little trouble with the computer this evening. I couldn't find the actual meeting number and my Zoom was fighting with the uh, link. Well, Tracy, welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, go ahead and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. And then I'm gonna give a little teaser on your upcoming Zoom. Ah, no sweat. Uh, Tracy Liggett, I'm in Fort Worth. I, uh, I'm an aircraft appraiser and I fly, I've flown 250s, 260s, and uh, most recently a PA-30. Good to have you here with us, Tracy. And um, yes, so Tracy's an aircraft appraiser. And for all of you who've been wondering about values, uh, Tracy's going to be giving a Comanche Zoom coming up. And uh, Tracy, I happened to look at the appraiser's uh, organization and its emphasis on integrity and uh, public trust. And it, it was really good to see that message there. We're very much looking forward to having you. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Sorry, sorry, I'm a little late. We're just in the pre-flight, uh, we're in the, the hangar flying section. So uh, you're not late. Uh, we'll be starting in about 10 minutes. And everybody jump in, say who you are, where you are and what you fly. Thanks, Feldman, Central Illinois. Uh, 1959 uh, PA-24. Hank, it is great to have you with us as always. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you. I might throw something personal in here. This morning, my wife came in and said, there is a bunch of stuff on our front lawn. And one of my kids, who is not likely to survive the next year, if I can... <laughs> 
had a great big sign put up. Happy birthday, Hank. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Happy birthday, Hank. Oh. Oh my goodness. Happy birthday. It is an honor to have you with us. It's an honor to be anywhere. <laughs> 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 Oh, those are great kids. You did good, you and Lynn. Well, welcome and happy birthday. Well, it's actually tomorrow, but uh, yeah. Oh, and I passed my driver's license today, my driver's test. I trust that bodes well for you getting your medical renewed as well. Oh, I don't, uh, I don't have any problem. I have already talked to the doctor about it. He said, yeah, sure, come on in. Doesn't get any better than that. Nope. Well, welcome, and uh, thanks for being here as always. Anybody jump in, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. I'm Ray Faye from Madison, Wisconsin. I fly a 260B model. And a beauty. Welcome, Ray, and thanks for being here. You bet, thank you. I'm and you were a bit broken. Oh, I was saying Lawrence Derby. I fly a Comanche 250 out of Hayward, California. Beautiful bird and welcome from California. Thanks for being with us. Hi, this is Chris Burnley. I'm also out of Hayward, California. I fly a 68 260B. Hello. Chris, welcome. Chris, you and I had a discussion. You have a printing company, yeah? I do. Great. Okay. I was, uh, I had lost my notes. You expect us to be in touch. Thanks for uh, being here tonight. Yeah, just and let me know just... anything you need. Brilliant. You'll be sorry you said that. <laughs> I'm sure I will. Hi, it's Dave Shaver again. I fly a P-51 Mustang. Oh, wait a minute. That was just for an hour about two weeks ago. I still have my 260 Comanche, but the Mustang flight at Stallion 51 was awesome. Dave Shaver, welcome. And you are in good company. There is another, I think, 260B driver. Um, I'm a straight 260. Coast. I'm straight oh, okay. 260. Yeah, I couldn't afford the third window. Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are four uh, or five Comanche drivers on the Ours East Coast. Ours is 65. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason you're in good okay. company is that there are a number of Comanche drivers that have second airplanes that fly air shows. Um, yeah, well, I used to fly air shows, but I, I gave, I had the Comanche and the pits at the same time. Sold the pits about 10 years ago. Are you serious? Yeah, I flew air shows. You, my friends, are getting a call. Well, thank you for letting us know. You'll be sorry you let that information out. <laughs> well, I Dave. flew that Mustang. That was the that's the pinnacle of my 50 years of flying, and that was my bucket list. And I went down to Stallion 51, and you fly the airplane probably 80 percent of the time, and it is just incredible. And they are what a first class operation. What a first you know, class operation. But anyway, I don't need the whole thing. I think we can put together a group by special and uh, cut, support them by getting enough pilots to come together <laughs> and get a discount. Well, you know, somebody, I don't know if it was Alan or, or Marty or somebody on the site put a picture up and we were chatting about this on the forum, on the, on Kristen's, on the, on the Comanche forum. Um, and the likeness of the Comanche and the P-51 is mm -hmm. uncanny. It really is. It was a it was a top to top bottom top to bottom picture. Oh, it was Marty. I see him coming here on the chat, and yep. I, I sent that to my partner, and he just laughed. He said, "I'm never going to hear the end of this P51 flight." <laughs> I said, "Only after you put me in a pine box." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm serious. Let's put together a group buy on flying that P51 if uh, in, and get enough pilots there that they can support themselves for a month just on eight or ten of us showing up for a discounted group buy special on well, P51 you know what flights. You could do. Lee Louder you could do back. a photo shoot of all the Comanches in a line behind the Mustang in the front. Well, they've got the same wing, I think, don't they? They do. It's, a, it's yeah, they very do. similar. It's very similar. It's a laminar flow. Um, but 
absolutely incredible. And Lee Lauterbach, <laughs> highest time, who owns the organization, highest time P-51 pilot in the world, 10,000 hours wow. in P-51s. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Highest <laughs> time, even higher than Bob Hoover. Bob Hoover, you know, he he had more time than Bob Hoover. He he was such a delight to talk to. But oh, yeah. I could drag this on all night. I'm going to jump out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, welcome and thanks. It's an honor to have you on with us tonight. And I apologize also for jumping in. Everybody jump into our hangar flying time. Say who you are, where you are, and what you fly in. Marty I'll, mentioned yes, exactly. I, I, I'll throw in a P-51 story. Uh, planes of Fame at uh, China, uh, you know, China uh, in L.A., you know, yeah, close enough. Uh, I did a photo shoot with uh, three beautiful Mustang cars, and they pulled out two P-51s, uh, both flyable and everything. So as uh, I got all done, and I went up to the one guy, and I said, you guys haul rides in these? He says, you're obviously a pilot. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he says, yeah. He says, we'll take one back, and if you want to, uh, we'll go up. You got to go become a member of Planes of Fame, which I did. And I took all the money I made uh, from doing that photo shoot. And I climbed into the back of a P-51 called Spam Can. <laughs> and up we went for a 20-minute ride. And it turned out to be 40 minutes. Too bad it wasn't a two-place. But you know what? I'll do that hang on trip anytime. The guy who flew it was an F-18 driver, a major, a Marine, and we spent three quarters of the time upside down. And I'll tell you, it was the ride of my life. It was my one and only thing in my life that I always wanted to do, and that was get a ride in a B-51. And yeah, they both have 23,000 series wings. Yeah. The... Um... The, the neat thing is that there were 23, I believe it was, TF-51s built, and uh, they have three of them right now down at Stallion 51, and it is full controls in the back seat. Everything right. is there, trim oh, tabs, wow. everything, and you, they teach you how to trim it, they teach you how to land. I made, I, I made a better landing on that airplane than I do in my Comanche. And it's on video. It's on video because they have, they have cameras mounted all over the airplane and it's video and audio of your whole flight for an hour. And I looped it, rolled it, I stalled it. The guy wanted me to accelerate, stall it. So I did an acceleration, accelerated stall. Um, just, just a delight to fly. And um, uh, of course, flying air shows, flying aerobatics my whole life, I was just in awe and they were kind of scared of me because most pits pilots that they fly with down there try to kill them because you know, they pull on it too hard and I said I know better and I'm here to learn I'm not here to try to show you anything so it was just great but yeah I'll tell you if anybody ever gets a chance to fly in a Mustang do it I got one Mustang story uh, this is Alan uh, anyway so it was like 1972. I'm learning to fly out of Houston Hobby, and it's Saturday afternoon, and I go do my little, um, you know, I'm just renting a Cessna 150 and flying to all the local airports, and I would always land and get a Coke and a candy bar and then go walk up and down the line and see what was for sale. Well, I landed over at Sugarland, Texas, and um, anyways, and it, I'm looking over in the grass, and there are six P-51s in camouflage green lined up uh, in a row. So I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Anyways, fast forward to 1983 and I'm interviewing, actually 86, I guess, 86. And I'm interviewing with uh, down Eastern Airlines down in Miami. So I'm in my little blue suit, white shirt, red tie. And uh, along with all the other guys, we're kind of talking while we're waiting our turn to either be an interview or whatever. And, oh, where are you from? Where are you from? And and this one guy says, oh, I'm from Houston, Texas. I said, oh, I grew up there. And, and uh, we got to talk about it a little bit more. And I said, yeah, you know, amazing. One day I, I sat there and I, I flew out to Sugarland, Texas on a Saturday morning. And there were six P-51s lined up on the grass. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's, my dad bought those airplanes. And I'm like, really? And, oh, wow. And I said, do you, you mind me if I ask you what, what you you know, what, what did your dad pay for those things? Now, this is going to make you cry, boys and girls. $35,000 a piece. Oh. Was that Junior Birchenall? 
I don't remember the guy's yeah. name, but was, uh, his dad bought a lot of airplanes down there, and then Junior kind of inherited a bunch of them. Yeah, down yeah, there. and I guess he had got them out of the Guatemalan Air Force. Yeah, where he got them. exactly. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So again, now thirty-five thousand. We're all comparing that to twenty twenty-one, but you know, back in those days, nineteen seventy-two-ish. I mean, that was the cost of a home. So. Uh, <laughs> But anyways, uh, yeah, what a deal, you know. Okay, I'm going to call time here. Uh, it's 730, and we got to get Will Carver going. So I'm going to mute everybody. You're going to have to, if you want to talk, you're going to have to uh, re-unmute yourself. That includes Will. And it's time for uh, part three of the, the continuing story of the uh, landing in, in Carolina. Will, you're on. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, it's the, it's the never ending story, it seems like. Um, but yeah, hi, everyone. If you've tuned in for the previous ones, you kind of know my backstory, but I fly, I flew and hope to fly again a uh, Comanche 260, uh, 1965. And I, I put it in a field back in November, and I've just been going through the rebuild process ever since. So I, I did a, the first one that's on the you know, in the archives was the, the engine failure, like the actual engine failure, this, like the story of how I made it from the air to the ground. Um, the next one was talking about the recovery. And this is the third in the, in the series of four, which is gonna talk about the rebuild. Um, and hopefully I can share some experiences I've, I've had with the Lycoming and other, um, other companies and the repair shop and everything like that to help everybody avoid some of the same uh, snake pits that I ran into. So here is uh, here's a little slide deck I prepared. So this is just to give everybody a little perspective. I th th thought I'd throw this picture up there. This was taken on January 18th. It was the first time the plane, uh, she, well, I said the first time she was back up on all three legs since she was taken apart around the 9th of November. So when you think about the timeline, that's about how long it took the shop to take. And they actually had, um, one full-time uh, A&P and then one part-time A&P that were almost exclusively dedicated to doing this. So you can kind of see what it a uh, what kind of timeline you're looking at. So I'll go through a brief recap of what happened. I'll talk about some initial rebuild considerations that, you know, I I kind of in hindsight I, I the things I thought about and then it, they're probably the same. But again, I I will say this is all based on my experience and so. If you have an experience that differs at any point along the way, please throw a comment in the chat. If you have a question at any point, just write it down in the chat. I'll just try to get through the material and then we can, um, I could try to entertain any questions or you know, please you know, throw your comments in at the end, uh, just so we get as much information in this form as possible. Um, let's talk about what, what maintenance was required to get done, specifically a hard landing inspection. And I know that uh, CJ mentioned that there were some questions about that the last time, the last Zoom when I mentioned that term. Um, where it came from, why I was referring to it, and I'll try to answer those questions in this setting. Uh, we'll talk about the rebuild timeline, so what you can expect from uh, Lycoming, because they pretty much control the timeline for the rebuild. Uh, and then you know, I'm going to talk about elective maintenance, things you should think about when you're going through this process, things you're not, not necessarily required to do, but it's, uh, it's beneficial. You, know, you kind of save some money. I, you know, I call it piggyback work, so the insurance companies paying for one thing. And if you can, you know, double dip on their, on their labor, then that's, you know, that's a, a win for you. Uh, and then the other category of elective maintenance, I would, I would call it convenient time. So I mean, your plane's going to be down, down and out for a number of months. So there's things that you wanted to do that um, take a considerable amount of time that you were, were kind of like putting off for annual, you know, an annual few years from now, or, you know, maybe the thousand hour gear AD, this is a good time to do it. Um, and then I'll go through my lessons learned throughout the process. So what happened, uh, this is a, just a little recap, catastrophic engine fail failure uh, caused by a connecting rod failing that put this hole in the top of my crankcase uh, right above the number six uh, cylinder uh, led to an off airport landing. That's the picture that you would have seen if you were in the previous zooms, but that's the uh, kind of the, you know, you have the, the problem and then this was my, my solution. Uh, and then, you know, the, there was damage to the antennas and the skins from the landing, but that's pretty much it. A lot of superficial issues. The plane was then recovered, uh, disassembled, and moved to 
Wilmington, North Carolina to a shop called Modern Aviation. And to recover and move the plane, they had to remove the wings, the stabilator, the rudder um, to move it to the repair shop. And then, you know, the, the part of the rebuild is obviously putting the pieces back together. Um, so the things I, I think that, you know, I thought about and that would apply to a lot of people, um, you know, you have to ask yourself these questions. What do you have to do to make the plane airworthy? So obviously at a very basic level, a plane can't fly without wings or a rudder or a stabilator. So you obviously have to reinstall that stuff. You have to, you know, connect the, um, reconnect and uh, rig all the control cables. Um, any other assembly that was taken apart, whether it was a flap or something, you know, I, I used the flap example because I had a flap assembly that was erroneously taken apart that had to get done to be make the plane airworthy. So you gotta think about, you know, what, what do you have on the list of things that you have to do? So you can make, you know, I, in my mind, I say make a list on, you know, on a piece of paper, make a left-hand column and a right-hand column. And on the left-hand column, put what are the things you have to do? Um, and a, and a, the next question is what work should also be done during the downtime? So this is kind of getting into the piggyback and the elective maintenance work that I was talking about previously. So that's what I would put in the right-hand column. So you have, you know, what do you have to do and what's a good time to do this? And then it's, it's one of those games you, you played as a child where you try to connect the, like the term to the definition, you draw lines across the page. And the more lines you can draw between what you have to do and what, what's a convenient time to do or what you should do, the more money you can save is a way you can think about it. Um, because the insurance company is gonna pay for all the stuff that you have to do and you can, you can double down on what they're doing. Um, and yeah, so what work should be done? You can maximize your aircraft downtime. That's, you know, that's in your right-hand column of things that uh, you should do. And obviously think about what services take the longest. So I use the thousand hour gear AD because that's something that uh, I think it's usually estimated between 20 and 24 hours of labor. So that's something that you, know, you, you might wanna take advantage of if you're not that far away from it. And then it's also a good example because it's, you know, I would call that piggyback work because they are going to have to re-rig the gear when you put the wings back in. So you can kind of uh, reap the benefit there as well. Another thing you think about is who's paying for what. So this is, again, your left-hand column is what the insurance company is paying for. Your right-hand column is everything else, just sticking with the same example. And then obviously piggyback on the insurance company's labor. And then this is my, this isn't an official anywhere, but this is kind of the way I boiled it all down. There's things you have to do, things you do because somebody else is helping you pay for it and things to do because it's a convenient time. Those are the kind of the three main types of work that you're gonna end up doing. Um, so the things I have to do. So uh, this is, you know, one wing going on and the, this is a slight, a spliced image of the left wing. So I tried to match it up, but if it makes you dizzy, uh, sorry about that. You know, obviously you're gonna replace all the, all the hardware. That's all gonna be all new, that, you know, that's stuff that you have to do that. You know, we talked about that last time. Um, you're not going to reuse a lot of those bolts that are uh, held in tension. So here's just a laundry list of things that I have to do, just a very like, you know, overarching. So you got to put the wings back in, the stabilator back in, the rudder back, back in, you got to replace the engine, you have to do a propeller flush because there was a sudden stoppage and there's a hole in the case. So they didn't know if metal made it into the propeller hub. Not likely, but it was something that the insurance company wanted. Um, you have to do an IRAN of the alternator. Well, you, the insurance company wanted to pay for an IRAN of the alternator and the vacuum pump. They didn't want to do an overhaul. And IRAN is, is cheaper. If you have questions about that, I can, I can answer as many as I, you know, to the extent that I understand the specifics of it. But um, it's not the same as an overhaul. It's less invasive, it's less expensive, but it uh, a lot of times accomplishes what you need to accomplish. And then there was a, a hard landing inspection. In, I, I mentioned in the last Zoom that I didn't feel like my landing was especially hard. Um, but since the insurance company is doing the labor or paying for the repairs, they're putting the plane back in the air. It's not really my, my risk to assume whether or not the landing was hard. Plus, I was also you know, hopped up on adrenaline. And I mean, it seemed like a great landing because I could walk away from it. So I, maybe it wasn't as smooth as I thought it was. But anyway, it wasn't really my decision to make. Um, it was presented to the insurance company. Do you want to look at, you know, would you pay for a hard landing inspection? And they would. And here's the, the reference that uh, if anybody's curious where it came from, it's the service manual from 2009. Uh, and there, it's in section 3-9C. And I'll give you the specific page. The unscheduled maintenance is what, it's, what it falls under for the hard landing inspection. And that's found on page 1D45. 
and the specific uh, hard landing is the 1D47. And it's, it's under the severe turbulence, hard or overweight landing section. And uh, if you're wondering what that looks like, this is what it looks like. So this is what's included in that. I just basically took a screenshot of the different uh, portions of the service manual. So they're gonna look at the landing gear struts, the wheel tires and brakes, uh, wheel wells, landing points, gear attach points. Um, and I had some of this, I had some, some skins on the, um, some rippling you know, in, in the wheel wells, but it, it wasn't anything major. And it was one of those, some of those issues where they weren't, they might've been there for years or they might've happened as a result of this landing. Is it possible to determine which, you know, which way, you know, the, which actually, what actually caused the damage. So rather than, uh, I mean, in plus an A&P looking at, you know, a rippled skin in, in the, the nose gear wheel well can't exactly, or the nose gear tunnel can't exactly just pretend they don't see it. So if they see it, they got to fix it. And um, if it can be traced, if, if it could possibly be connected to the hard landing, it, it goes towards the hard landing inspection. So here's the wings. You gotta look at the engine mounts. So an example, I had to get my engine mount um, I ran, and they actually found a couple of cracks in it. So they had to overhaul the engine or to overhaul the engine mount. And uh, that was part of the hard landing inspection, which was covered under the insurance. I guess one of the interesting decisions I got to make about the engine mount was the color. So you get to pick the color of your engine mount if you have to get it overhauled. And then these are the last two pieces, the fuselage and the empennage. Uh, nothing really that should surprise anybody. It's like a lot of just kind of a deep dive looking for, you know, basically structural damage, you know, rippling, um, really, really any, anything. But it, it's a very thorough inspection. And it was required for, for me to get my plane back in the air. Um, so results of my hard landing inspection, I had a wrinkled skin in the wheel tunnel at the engine mount. Again, I mean, who knows where that came from? It's possible it came from this, it's possible it came from something else. Uh, a cracked engine mount necessitating an overhaul, like I mentioned, some cracked skin under wing pockets, uh, aft floorboard, floorboard, aft floor support stringer was cracked and a forward floor support stringer was cracked. Not, excuse me, not cracker, stringer was cracked. Um, and yeah, so those are, I mean, th those are all things, like I said, it's, it's hard to pinpoint the actual cause of the damage, but it's, it is possibly connected to landing it off of an airport. Um, so let's talk about the timeline for your, your, your rebuild. So this is a, this is a little bit of a dated picture. It's a couple of weeks old at this point. Um, obviously the engine mount is, that was the original one. Uh, so that one is not there anymore. It's currently being overhauled. Um, but the number one consideration for your timeline is going to be your, your engine order and, or your overhaul. So, um, and I'll talk about, you know, the options that, you know, were in front of me and, you know, what the dollars were and, I try to throw as many, as much actual data in here as I can. So if anybody's curious about the cost of something or you have a more detailed question, uh, you can throw it in the chat or you can contact me through my contact info later and I can give you a, a more definite answer about what I, what I paid for something. I'm not trying to like hide the ball or anything because um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, questions about how much things cost. So the new and or rebuilt timeline is uh, from Lycoming is 30 to 60 working days, which uh, uh, works out to be about six to 12 weeks of actual waiting for your uh, your engine. And I will say that you'll, throughout this presentation, you'll, you'll see the term rebuilt um, and slash remanufactured. The, I guess the uh, talking to people like Malcolm, the, the appropriate term is a factory remanufactured engine. If an engine is put out of the factory to like new standards, but it's not a new engine, but Lycoming calls those rebuilt engines. So, um, even though it's a factory manufactured, I, I will try to stick to the right term to the extent possible, but I'll, and I try to catch it, but just to let everybody know that, you know, so we're talking about the same thing. Uh, my current shipment timeline is 14 weeks. So uh, fingers crossed the engine's supposed to ship out of the factory tomorrow. Um, haven't heard anything, so I'm not too optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the engine. So what, what, what are we looking at for cost and the different options that were in front of me? So you, everybody here saw my case, big hole on the top of it. Uh, that's the, you know, it's a very big paperweight. It doesn't, can't do a whole lot right now. Um, so let's talk about the quotes I had. So I, I was given a $45,000 quote for an engine shop overhaul of that engine you see on the right there. So they would actually basically toss the case 
and use all the same components and just do, do a standard overhaul. Uh, and that was a, I mean, that was the first option I actually looked at because um, when, you know, when I, when I called the engine shop, uh, they gave me, they kind of gave me the, you know, the hard truth that, you know, Lycoming may not give you core credit for this engine because it has a whole, is a huge hole in it. And the, the a &P who I spoke with told me that there was almost a zero chance I was going to get any core credit for it. Um, I had a narrow deck engine, so I was like, I was holding out hope, but he was trying to crush my dreams. Um, anyway, he took my serial number, gave it to Lycoming and was very surprised um, when Lycoming came back and told me they were going to give me core credit, some core credit for my engine. So, but, so these were the two options that were in front of me at the time. So $69,000 for a Lycoming factory rebuilt slash remanufactured or $45,000 for a shop over, engine shop overhaul. So at this point, the engine shop overhaul seems like a, a pretty good option. I mean, it is a pretty reputable shop. I had no reason to think that, you know, I would, I wouldn't be getting a new engine, but for all intents and purposes, I'd be getting you know, a, a, a engine that's in pretty good condition. Um, but, you know, the standard core credit for a Lycoming narrow deck, uh, as of when I, Put, the, put my order in was 26,000 and they gave me 21,000 for my, uh, for that, you know, the core credit on that engine that you see on the right. Um, now, so, you know, that brings my price down to $48,000 for a factory rebuilt slash remanufactured. So now we're just talking about a $3,000 difference between a remanufactured engine and an overhaul. So, I mean, that kind of took any hard thinking out of the, the decision-making process because I mean, three three more three thousand dollars more for a factory remanufactured engine is, to me is a, is a no brainer. I think it'd be to a lot of people as well. Um, I put the uh, the twenty five thousand dollar deposit required. I, I put that little uh, bullet in there because um, I just think anybody should know that if this happens to them, I, I had no idea that that this was going to happen. So, you know, go figure. I decided, okay, I want a factory remanufactured, and then the engine distributor said, okay, we need a check for twelve thousand dollars to even put this order in. And then they need the other 75%, so the other 36,000 uh, when I um, when I go to, excuse me, prior to the engine shipping from the factory. So they won't ship it until you, you pay them in full. Um, and they, they don't accept credit cards. So just something to think about if you're in this situation. And then you also have to pay a $750 delivery fee and they don't let you pick it up from the factory anymore. I guess that policy changed right before COVID hit last year. and uh, I think COVID, COVID solidified their decision to not let people come into the factory to pick up their engine. Um, and we're talk we talked to Malcolm Dickinson about this last night, and he was able to pick up his engine, I think he said 12 years ago from the factory, um, but they don't let you do that anymore. And, and, it, and you know, I have, I have family that lives, you know, a few miles from the factory, and I asked if I could Get it delivered there and save any money on shipping, and it's not, it's a flat rate shipping. So anywhere you ship in the country, you're going to pay seven hundred fifty dollars for the delivery. Um, so big takeaway from a big learning a lesson that I learned from this experience is you really have to advocate for yourself when you're ordering the engine because um, you got to do your own research because they don't really they're not. I used this example last night when I was telling the CJ and the, some other members of the group about this, but you're not. Um, they're not trying to sell you a car. So they're not telling you like all the features, all the different things, all the, the different options you can get on, that are available for your specific model of an engine. Um, not that there's a lot, but there are some, some things you can, you can factor in. And um, you know, one of them is the Lycoming's EIS or their electronic ignition system. Um, no, they didn't tell me that I could, that, that was even an option. So I put the order and I put it in for just, okay, here's an, an IO 550. Um, and then I emailed the distributor later on. And I said, is there any chance I could, you know, can, is it possible to get this electronic condition put on there? And they said, oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's no additional cost. And I was kind of like, well, why wouldn't you just tell me that when I was like ordering the engine? But anyway, they don't, they don't tell you that. So you have to advocate for yourself, do the research, see what's available. Um, look on Lycoming, look on blogs, you know, anything you can get your hands on. So I actually decided to go with uh the electronic ignition. I'll explain that decision in the next slide. I'll explain something else I learned about the, their their electronic ignition in the next slide as well. Um, you also have to kind of advocate for yourself on changes in the delivery date. So uh, the the first time the delivery date was postponed, I didn't find out about it until four days before it was supposed to ship. And 
I got an email from the distributor. It was supposed to ship on a Friday. I got an email from a distributor on a Monday saying, hey, we need to, you know, the factory's asking what the voltage is on your electrical system. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is really late in the game to be asking me that question. Um, it's considering it's supposed to leave in, you know, four days, but maybe they, this is how they work. Um, so I called their, they called the distributor the next day and she's like, oh yeah, it's going to be delayed two weeks. So, okay, well, that's good to know. Um, but just, you know, make sure you stay on top of them, the distributor, the factory. Uh, I would say that you're not really going to get a hold of many people at the factory. They're not, they're, they're helpful if you email them, but generally if you try to call them, you're not going to get a lot of uh, support with respect to a specific engine order. So you got to really rely on your distributor and whether it's, it's air power or I used uh, triad, um, in North Carolina, you just got to kind of stay after them and they're very helpful and they, you know, they won't be too like offended if you're just bothering them. Um, so let's talk about the Lycoming electronic ignition. So, you know, some things are not what they seem. So it's just branded as a electronic ignition system, but it's really just an electronic mag. So anybody who has a Surefly uh, will recognize this picture because it looks exactly like a Surefly, but it has Lycoming written on it and it's black, uh, but it is, not a surefly. Um, I mean, it, it is, but it isn't. And I'll explain what that means. So Lycoming went ahead and is selling this right now as a fixed timing magneto replacement. And they're not allowing you to change the dip settings. And when we say not allowing, they're covering up the, um, the opening, like the portal that you use to actually go in and change the dip settings on this, uh, on this system. Um, so, it's, it's basically just a fixed timing magneto replacement. Uh, I put a side note in here is that they won't ship an incomplete engine because I, I was talking about, you know, like, wow, so they're going to send me a engine with a magneto and a electronic magneto, which has some benefits, I guess. But um, a fellow Comanche pilot from down here in Georgia, David Asman, asked, asked me, he's like, well, they see if they'll send you an engine without magnetos and just credit you the cost. I was like, that's an interesting question. So I asked the factory and they said, absolutely not. They won't ship an incomplete engine. Um, cause I figured if I could get an engine without magnetos, I could just put the one I want on and put a surefly on or an electro air or whatever I, I choose to do, but not an option if you're thinking about it. Um, so Lycoming doesn't charge any additional costs over this, over a traditional magneto to get this system. Uh, I opted for it because of, you, know, you get the standard benefits of electronic mag. You don't have to overhaul it. It's supposed to be low maintenance. It's supposed to be more reliable. Um, and then more, like a more consistent spark. It had no additional cost to me. So I, I was at least saving the cost of the, the overhaul and the maintenance, but then it raises the question of like, well, what if I want to put a Surefly on or something like that? I mean, you know, someone's probably asking, thinking right now, why didn't he just get a two Magnetos and just put a Surefly on it? Um, it just didn't make sense to me to do that. So, and why not just swap this thing out with an electuary or Surefly upon uh, delivery? Well, there was a, I'm, I'm an attorney and I'm kind of risk averse and, I try to read the fine print and, you know, if you read their warranty from Lycoming, they give you a nice 24 calendar month warranty for a factory. Here, here it is, a rebuilt reciprocating aircraft engine. But, you know, in, this, in the fine print, it says it's not going to apply to any engine altered outside of Lycoming's factory in any way. In any way, it's basically Lycoming retains their own sole judgment to determine whether or not, um, an aftermarket piece of equipment that you added to the plane caused the engine to fail. Um, a 24 calendar month warranty is nice. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until the existing Magneto needs to be overhauled. And then I'm going to go ahead and replace that with a Surefly or an Electro Air and then incorporate a, uh, a secondary electrical system to um, to, to operate with that uh, capability. And I've, I've, I've talked to Surefly about it and they, uh, they said that's something that I, could, I can do. And they were actually surprised. Surefly was surprised because they, they said that they were under the impression that Lycoming was selling um, a variable timing uh, electronic conditions, which they are. They're just not doing it for the five, uh, 540s yet. And interestingly enough, the Surefly system I should, the, the Lycoming system is uh, actually operates under a different STC than the Surefly system, even though it's exactly the same. Um, if you, I mean, they're the same system, but if you talk to Lycoming, there's like different 
systems, which I think is just a, I don't even know what that means, but just so everybody understands, it's a, that's kind of the, the playing field with respect to Lycoming's electronic ignition system, which is really just an electronic magneto. Um, but anyway, that was just a little a tangent, but something I kind of peeled back the onion on and I thought I would save everybody else the pain of having to figure that out. Um, so things I'm doing because someone else is helping me pay for it. I'm replacing the conduits, which are costing me 865 uh, per assembly plus the waiver. That those are Piper conduits I got that I ordered. Um, and you know, I'm the gear has to be re-rigged. So replacing the conduits, I, there is going to be some saving. And a lot of this, uh, the savings that I anticipate are a lot of it's speculative, and it's going to be kind of in the discretion of the A and P to, you know discern what you know what should be on the insurance company what should be on me um but one of the things i'm doing since the plane is all opened up already and the gear assembly is you know just been re-rigged is i'm going to bring in an expert to look at the gear specifically matt kurt's going to uh, come in over zoom and kind of do a, a deep dive into the gear to make sure that everything was rigged properly um but again that's something i can do because the plane's opened up courtesy of the insurance company one of the things that was uncovered during the reassembly was the left main fuel bladder was leaking uh, I had always thought that the inside of the cabin smelled funny, and now I have confirmation of why. Um, but that bladder costs nine twelve. I got that from uh, FFC. Uh, I think Aerotech doesn't. They had like a three week turnaround time on an order. FFC got it out to me within within three days, so that's why I went with them, and it was cheaper. Uh, so in three twelve includes the. Uh, the install kit for it as well. So that's, I think you'll pay that and maybe some tax to get out the door, but that's what the left-hand main fuel bladder uh, is gonna cost you. I, I think, I've, again, I'm saving a little bit because the planes opened up, courtesy insurance company. Um, I also, I'm also opting to install some magnetic fuel centers. So because uh, one of the most labor intensive components of those fuel centers, and I think Adam had asked a question about this and I know David Asman's working on his fuel centers as well, is running the, running the wires to every single fuel center. Um, and since the wings are off, the wings were off of the plane, they could identify where they wanted to run the wires and kind of work their way around the, um, the inner components of the wing in order to kind of maximize the efficiency and not waste a lot of time trying to put those, uh, those wires into a per, like a already assembled plane. I mean, I think the quote that, uh, my AMP gave me was, it seems like Piper ran the wires to the landing light and then built the wing around that those wires because they're they're so they're so isolated and cut off from everything else but that's what the center centers look like at the bottom if you're curious i'm going to go ahead and replace the edm 700 with a cgr 30 pnc which was 51.99 after a rebate and uh you know plus the labor um the be the benefit i see there is that i had an edm 700 they you know the shop was going to reconnect that when um when they got the new engine. So instead of having them reconnect that, I'm just having them, you know, connect a, the sensors for a CGR 30 P and C. That's what that component is in case. So just to clarify the title on this slide, someone else is helping to pay for it. They're not actually helping to pay for any of these items that you're adding to your airplane, right? You're just taking advantage of the fact that the wings are opened up. That, that's a great point, Malcolm. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah, I, all of these dollars that you see are, you know, that's coming out of, out of my bank account, but it's, it's the labor that I'm trying to, this, the, which is a speculative component of it, but that's what I'm trying to, to capitalize on. Yeah, the, uh, they're not, the insurance company's not paying for any of these components. These are all things that I'm having to pay for, um, but I'm trying to capitalize on the labor. Thank you for clarifying that, Malcolm. That's an excellent point. And then- yeah, Because if you did need to, if you did want to do these various things like the senders or the, re, or the wiring uh, out to wings, it would be really time consuming to do. But if the wings are off the airplane or opened up anyway, which they have to be in your case, then you you take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the fact that the wings are wings are off and the engines off, it it, it just exposes a lot of the plane. It just say you're right, Malcolm. It just saves a ton of the labor that would be spent trying to access different parts of the plane that are normally inaccessible um, without you know really taking the plane apart. And then the, the last thing I put on there is the this switch. I'm going to make that switch just because no, no pun intended, because uh, I'm not a super big fan of the Magneto key. And I mean, I'm probably not going to save a lot of money on this, on the waiver on this one, because, you know, they're going to have to reconnect the ignition to the, the engine. But you know, how much money am I going to save by, by doing that? Probably not a lot, but it's, it's something else that 
you know, there may be some savings, but that's probably the, that's probably a stretch. All the other ones I think are more, uh, more readily apparent by the fact that the plane's being opened up. Um, so things I'm doing because it's convenient. This is like my, my chicken scratch of, um, you know, what I plan to do with the panel because the plane is down for the count for so long. Um, I was yeah, I'm just trying to take advantage of the downtime by doing some other work as well. So, you know, I'm getting a dual G5s, the GAD 29, 13, and then the GNC 355. And you can see where uh, those different components are going to go. Uh, the Genesis 60 PSS, I'm going to try to relocate and repair that because it's currently an op. That's actually down here, right underneath the throttle. Um, and then obviously I'm installing fill air shoulder harnesses. Uh, so those are $880, $880 to purchase uh, plus install. But his, uh, just so everybody is aware, his price just went up because of his, a, a, like someone in the supply channel went out of business or shut down or something, or and the cost increased by not a significant amount, but just to be aware of that. Um, and I thought this was just a little, so today when I was thinking about, you know, I, project creep is a real thing. I thought I would go through the, uh, you know, how it affected me. So the, I mean, this is just, it's kind of comical to me in hindsight, just looking at it. Cause I was like, why did I end up with a, this panel? Like, why did I decide to make these decisions? So I kind of went back in time and, oh no, you can't see that's a bad picture. So the starting point was, I'll just, you know, I can read it to you guys. Um, I wanted a WASH GPS, which is the GNC 355. And I wanted the CGR 30 PNC to be co-located on the left side of the radio. So you can see from this image here that this is what I wanted. I wanted a WASH GPS because this, this Apollo thing is not no longer updated by, um, by Garmin. They don't issue new maps for it. And then I wanted these CGRs on this side of the uh, radios. So going from there, you know, I originally settled on the Garmin GPS 175 because it was the least expensive option. Um, so I, I apologize for formatting on this slide. It's all kind of jacked up. Um, the, I mean, the GPS 175 was kind of my original, you know, step one. And then um, I also considered that I should probably try to look at transitioning away from these narcos because there's a there's only a handful of shops that still service those things and they're reasonably reliable. But I was like, well, I could make a transition away by adding in a comm radio. So I decided to go with the GNC 355, which is a WASH GPS with a comm radio. Um, so you know, the GNC 355 also happens to be incompatible with narco CDIs. So it's, it's not gonna talk to this CDI right here. So the result was I needed to keep a narco CDI to link up to the existing nav radio for the, uh, the narco. But I also needed a Garmin CDI to speak to this, uh, speak to the 355. So the options I have were the GI 106B, the G5 and the GI 275. Those are kind of the main uh, CD, like systems that can support a CDI. So I don't actually have panel space to add a CDI because I'm putting the CGRs here without removing something else. So I need to somehow double down um, on, my, on my panel. So I picked the G5. And the reason I did that was because I can get it, you know, I can have it take up my HSI, but also it can also talk to the GNC 355. So I get rid of an instrument, really two, and I, uh, I save the panel space. And then I decided to add the G5 attitude indicator to, uh, and also pull the vacuum out to improve, you know, safety and reliability. I said, yeah, well, I mean, why not? It's going to be in time to do so. But that's just an example of project creep of how like one thing leads to another, to another, to another. Um, but anyway, so lessons learned, I'm sure everybody, I mean, you guys can share your examples of how, you know, a simple project gets blown out of proportion. I mean, it's, anytime you, you open up a panel, that's going to happen. Um, so the lessons I learned and I'd recommend is put your or engine order in ASAP. So as soon as you figure out from your insurance company, if your plane's not totaled after an engine failure, I, I think you need to immediately start working out, um, you know, your, your financing and start exploring your options. I mean, I, I went ahead and uh, talked to um, the engine shop and kind of knew what my options were ahead of time and was kind of preloaded, ready to go to order the engine. I didn't think the plane was told. I had, I had a pretty good feeling the plane would not be totaled. So I kind of lined everything up to the point where, you know, nothing hit, hit the point of no return. And then as soon as I got the green light, then I kind of moved forward. But yeah, the engine order is, is the, the biggest uh, holdup in the timeline. And another interesting thing that I, I was talking to Malcolm about with the engine order is, um, 
it, the, the engine order and delivery process doesn't actually stop when you get the engine. It stops when you return your core, assuming you're going to get a, get a credit. So one of the things you have to submit when you order your engine, if you're returning your core for credit, is you have to put the order in and you have to write them a check for the amount of the uh, core credit. And Wycoming holds on to that check until they get the core. But if they don't get the core within their deadline, which I think is like 90 or 120 days from when the engine ships, they cash the check and you lose out on the core credit. Um, so it's, it's really important. So, I mean, it's important to stay engaged with the shop. So as soon as that new engine gets delivered and they're, you know, reinstalling it, that's great, but you, you need to stay on top of your shop to turn around and get rid of that engine, send it back to Lycoming because you're not going to have much recourse against that shop when all of a sudden that check gets cashed and you're out, you know, I'm out 21 grand. Um, I have no reason to think that's going to happen, but it, it's just a, something to think about because it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, like I said during the presentation, you got to advocate yourself during the order and the delivery pro process. You know, project creep is a real thing. And I would just recommend basic things like develop a budget, build in a buffer for surprises. I mean, it's really tempting when I look at my panel to say, oh, it's not, it's not that big of a jump to go from a 355 to a, um, you know, to a GTN 650 or something like that. And you get all, you know, all those extra great capabilities that, you know, the shiny panels and all those lights are very tempting, but there's things that pop up. And the perfect example for me is the, uh, the thousand dollar, I mean, almost thousand dollar fuel bladder. That was not a anticipated expense, which was not anything the insurance company was going to, going to even consider covering. Um, but you have to, uh, you just have to build a buffer. And so it's, I would recommend, you know, just building a budget, sticking to it and making sure you have a buffer of, depending on the size of the damage, probably five to $10,000. Um, always plan for the worst case for the timeline and everything else. Um, you know, one of the big things that I think can be said about the rebuild process is you have to be kind of a, you, you have to be almost like a project manager. I mean, that's the term CJ used for it because you have so many things going along. I mean, I, I, right now I'm, you know, constantly, you know, putting pressure on EI to figure out when they're going to ship the CGRs. I actually just got an email this evening, um, constantly putting pressure on the engine distributor to figure out when that engine is going to, going to get shipped. Um, and you know, you're just trying to coordinate all these different things. And it, the, the more engaged you are, the easier it is to kind of get ahead of things. But I'll, I mean, I'll admit there's even things that I've, I've kind of, you know, not been successful in. And one of the, the easy examples was, um, the shop working on the plane pushed out the hoses to get the hoses redone, basically just get them replaced with, you know, like hoses. Um, so I, I tried to get ahead of it. As soon as I found that out, I called the hose shop and told them to let me know when they get the hoses because I wanted to replace them with Teflon hoses uh, where, you know, where I could. Um, I probably should have followed up with it more. I didn't. And, you know, a week and a half later, I never got that call in the, you know, brand new hoses end up in in the shop, you know, where, where the plane's going. So I'm not, it's not really, a, you know, a loss for me. It's not exactly what I wanted, but you know, it could have, could have gone better. Um, yeah. And that falls in the category of proactively stay engaged and just stay after your, uh, the rebuild. I mean, I, I'm texting my AMP at least twice a week, asking him for a status update. I mean, it was pretty slow at the beginning because, you know, they're kind of getting the wings in and that's kind of a slow process and building the equipment for the wings. Um, but definitely stay engaged with it kind of throughout the process to the extent you can. Um, if you can go there and be there and bother them, that's even better. But I mean, it, I, I've kind of realized that in this industry, it seems like the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So the more I, you know, I'll use the term harass my, uh, my a and the more, you know, progress I see getting done. Um, and then, you know, I, I say here, make sure you're a really supportive spouse. My wife's been great. But no, another thing too, is make sure you have a really supportive, um, group of people that you can kind of bounce ideas off, good sounding boards, uh, just to do common sense checks. Cause you're making, you're making a lot of decisions. A lot of them, they're not time set time sensitive, but they're going to feel time sensitive because you want to get everything done. You want to get your plane back. Um, and it's good to have fellow pilots, um, A and P's or not that you can bounce ideas off of. And you, you, you can ask them about different types of equipment. Is it worth getting this? Is it worth, worth getting that? And I mean, you know, one example I would give is uh, I've developed a good relationship with uh, David Asman down here in Georgia. And, you know, I, I told him what I wanted to do to my panel and he made the comment about um, like the, the Garmin GAD 13 is like a $400 part. 
And he told me, he's like, hey man, why do you look at getting the Davtron version of that, which is like a third of the price. So I was like, oh, that's a good point. So I did that. And, uh, you know, I, there is some more expense I'm incurring because it's not part of a kit anymore. So I'm getting a Davtron component and combining it with a Garmin system. Um, but I'm still saving like 200 bucks. I mean, you know, $200 in a, you know, you're looking at the price of a remanufactured engine is not a, uh, it's kind of, in, it seems insignificant, but I mean, if, if you can do that here and there, that makes a big difference. And uh, that's all I have. So if anybody has any questions, um, we could definitely go to the chat. Uh, Jim Evans here. Did you consider the um, dual exhaust while everything's apart? Good question. My plane already has a dual exhaust on it. Oh, good for uh, you. So didn't I didn't have to, fortunately. <laughs> One of the things I didn't have to think about. Let's see. What about some of the uh, speed mods that could be added uh, around the fuselage? Have you considered those? That's a good question. I, I thought about doing that. And I, honestly, I mean, the, with the cost of everything else that I, I don't want to go that deep into like my, into my buffer. That's, I mean, I have some, the only ones I, the ones I would want to get would be like the, uh, the gear lobes. Um, I have the nose gear ones, but the previous owner, for some reason, to put the, uh, the main gear lobes in. And I just, I don't want to jump into that. And th there's no, there's no really good way I can, I can capitalize on the insurance company's labor there. I, I just don't see a, a good connection to it. Because adding those uh, speed mods doesn't require, there's no benefit to adding them today in, instead of yeah. a year from now during the annual or something. And of course, you're also talking to someone who just had to write a check for a, uh, a new engine. I mean, I, yeah, I, I put those, those, do, those dollars on there because I think a lot of times the, the cost of these things can kind of get lost. And, um, but yeah, it's not an not a insignificant sum of money. If, if there was not, if I wasn't getting any core credit, I would be, I'd be getting the uh, engine shop overhaul. I wouldn't be getting a factory rebuilt, so. On, on your engine monitor instruments from EI, did you consider the MVP 50 at all, or was there any thought about going that route from EI? So I decided to stick with the, um, the circular instruments. I was trying to avoid cutting to the panel much. That's why I stayed away from the, the MVP right. in, the, in the GAPI. That's, and that's, that's usually a big consideration. I wondered if that was it or not. My, my problem with the small one, in the circles is there's so much there seems to be so much information in there and my eyes aren't what they used to be so i'll be constantly trying to lean forward and i feel like i would be leaning forward to squint trying to see you know what i'm looking at but i don't know if that's really the case or not I, i'll have to let you know I've, I've heard good things i didn't want them to be on the right side of the radios for that reason i don't want to have to struggle to see them i thought that was kind of a poor placement by um with Piper, but I think it was probably the best decision at the time, uh, given everything else had to be on the panel. But they have, I mean, it, it does have all kinds of alerts and sensors in it. So it's, you know, it's, you, I feel like you can see a lot of the main information on there. There's also a lot of like, EI gives you an option of like, it's like 29 different things you, you, you pick from a list. It's a more information than you could possibly want. And there's even like an enunciator sheet that they gave me and I get to fill this out. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to put in here. So, I mean, I could, I could look mine up, but it's like, they are enunciators that are not your standard enunciators. So it's stuff that, what do you, what random information do you want to be displayed, displayed in front of you? So I was like, oh, I'll put a, I'll put an enunciator up there for a fuel pump. So I can, I'll put something on the in front of me that says my fuel pump's on. Um, Somewhat like one for pedo heat. I put one up there for that. So it's instead of it being down under, you know, by my knees, I can see right in front of me that my pedo heat's on. But I mean, even that, I was like, you have to list six. I'm like, you know, I was really scratching my head to think about, you know, what six things do I need? Hopefully, you put an enunciator there to remind you if it's your anniversary or your wife's birthday. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> That's me, she'll remind him. 
yeah, I'll, I'll install the shoulder harness lights. So now I know when the shoulder harnesses are, are being used. <laughs> you know, one comment on the, uh, this is Alan here. And I, I put a brand new light combing 0540 reman two years ago. So I did the same thing. I went through air power uh, down in Arlington and asked them, you know, okay, so how does this work? And they go, I and initially I think all I had to do was write them a check for 500 bucks to get the order in, but I, I'm not, don't definitely remember that. Maybe it was 25%, uh, but I do remember having to write that second check uh, for the core. And, uh, and then of course, you know, you uh, get that back after Lycoming and get your old engine. Interesting in that I'm not, I was talking to a friend of, with Continental, I mean, he's got a Bonanza or something like that. And, um, I think Continental gives you something like four weeks or two uh, two weeks. It's a ridiculously uh, tight uh, time frame for Continental to get your engine back. Again, I'm this was a while back, but I I thought Lycoming was pretty generous and then going, yeah, yeah, we'll just we need your engine back in three weeks. I mean, three months or four months, whatever it is. It's it's. Pretty, and again, I, I, I kind of asked, I said, well, what are they going to do with it? Because it was a narrow deck engine. And I go, yeah, we'll probably crush it. So um, anyways, but because they'd like to get those out of the system. But anyways. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, so I actually asked them this, like, you know, they gave me the timeline. I was like, what is it? You know, why does this take so long? And they're like, well, it's a, it's like, you know, gas station sheets. It's a made to order engine. They don't keep anything they keep the parts on hand, but they don't keep any, any inventory of engines or um, just the, like some of the major components, but it just takes an eternity. Plus I was, I was also competing with a Christmas timeline, which is probably why they, that's probably where the two week additional delay came from. And who knows? You know, I, I think you lucked out amazingly well because I ordered uh, a brand, I, I needed a new engine for my Cessna. Um, and I, two years ago I did Penyan rebuilt, uh, my IO 540, but um, I needed a 360 and like homing made me pay in advance the entire amount. So you, you, you really did well with a 25% down, down payment. Now that might be my credit history that they found out about. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it definitely helps. I mean, you, it, it's one of those things, like I, I mentioned this in the presentation that you, everything feels like it's moving so fast, but what you really have to do immediately is put the engine order in. So the ability to just have to just put 25% down and not have to, you know, and then take the next, you know, what did I say? 12 weeks to figure out where the rest of the money is going to come from is, is a huge, huge help. Well, I, I also put the order in um, on the Monday after Christmas. So it was the 27th or 28th of December. And they, they've told me they're going to ship on the 26th of March, Friday, March 26th. But I, I can't get a single word on whether they're late, whether they're, I, I'm assuming they're not going to send it early, but it's, it's really agonizing waiting for it. No, so, it's, so Josh, I can tell you that I've been working with a, um, the engine shop I work with, I, I call them regularly and I've been bothering this. So my engine's supposed to ship on tomorrow and I've been bothering this woman all week. Like, Hey, what is going on? And she finally called me back this afternoon. She's like, Hey, I'm not ignoring you. She's like, the factory's ignoring me. Um, but she said that she, what she thinks is going to happen is she's every, she said every morning she goes in, she gets the engine, like all the shipment numbers for all the engines that are coming out of the factory. And she's like, I wouldn't be surprised if I came in tomorrow, Friday or Monday. And I just had an email telling me that the engine had been shipped. So they just don't tell us. She's like, you know, they, don't, they won't commit to a date, which is very frustrating for us. No, and I think that's the way it worked when I had mine done. All of a sudden, within within a, a, a week or some time frame, you know, I mean, after a couple, several months, but all of a sudden I just, boom, got this blank email that just said, yeah, your engine's ready to ship and um, stand by. And like you said, I mean, you'll know because... Uh, Again, if you're doing it like yours, they're going to want the balance, um, you know, to the distributor. And so basically the engine is paid for before they ship it to you. So, um, yeah. Yeah, they only took a, uh, they, when I say they don't take credit card, they only took a, I think a wire. I think that was the only way I could give them. I, I had to wire, I had to wire them. Yeah. 
It's kind of hey, Bill, this is Marty. Let's say it's all the credit card points. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Bill, this is Marty. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the first uh, installment of your uh, of your series. Um, what was the original cause of the failure? Was it a stuck valve, exhaust valve? It looked like it was number six cylinder. So the Wycombe hasn't pulled the engine apart yet, and you know the, the FAA is also wondering what the cause was. So as soon as I can figure that out, I'll definitely share with everyone. From what we can tell from a bore scope, the number six connecting rod broke away from uh, the number six piston and just took a field trip around the inside of the case and you know punched holes in it and then it it made contact with the uh, the camshaft. You can actually see in some of the pictures, like when I opened up the the cowling, I could look into the hole. And I could see that the camshaft was actually just broken apart, wow. um, which I imagine as soon as that happened, it shut down, all, all the valves shut down at the same time and the engine just went kaput immediately. Crazy. So on your, uh, when you did your uh, reman engine from Lycoming and you gave them the down payment, then you were expected to give them the core, the core, which was the, the whole engine, or do you just have to send them the cases? So they want, the, they want the whole engine. So they send you the engine with- um, Minus the accessories. Yeah, minus the accessories. So yeah. the, the engine comes with magnetos. It doesn't come with alternators or vacuum pumps. So everything that they send to you, they want to receive your version back. Um, oh, so wow. it's, okay. it's not just the case, it's the entire engine. Oh, I got you, okay. Yeah. And, and another thing is that uh, interesting is like we will verify, I guess, that that is indeed a Lycoming engine and Lycoming cylinders. And and uh, somebody was telling me, I guess, actually it was Air Power was telling me, goes, yeah, that's to preclude somebody from buying a Hulk piece of 0540, bolting it together, you know, and then, oh, find a cylinder here and a piece of junk there and putting it together and go, send it back and go, Hey, yeah, here's my core. And they're like, no, this is not, this did not come from us. You know? Well, you know, when I sent my core in to get my reman, I'm pretty sure I had to provide the engine log. Uh, you did. Uh, you know what? That, that is true. They want the engine log. And I sat there and I told them, uh, Back in the very early time frame, I said, you know, this is all incorporated with kind of my airframe log and this and that. And I said, there's no way I'm sending you my log. And they go, just send us a copy. And I go, oh, okay. And then I'll, I'll do that. So uh, in my case, it was the old hardbound engine log that came with the airplane when it was new in 1968. So wow. I sent them that. And uh, I don't know that they ever looked at it because, of course, they're just going to melt it down and use exactly. it for scrap metal. But that was the requirement. Alan, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I think you had the same situation that I did where I actually was thinking about th that today. And I have, I made digital copies of my logbook before I gave them to the shop that's doing the work. Um, and I realize now, I, think, I don't know why I was thinking about this today, but all of the, uh, there are a number of ADs that for some reason, some A&P at some point thought that, you know, a component of the engine was part of the airframe and they, you know, they, they crossed the stream, so to speak. So I, I'm glad that I have digital copies of that because I, for the same re, same concern that you have, I was like, I, I would not want to give away my only copy of all these uh, AD records. Of all my log books, yeah. I said, so I have log books totally intact from the time it came out of Piper in 63, you know, and uh, I just flat out told them, hey, you're not getting my physical log book. So um, interesting though, uh, my new engine, I do have a totally separate logbook for that engine, uh, which my new, my shop, uh, said, yeah, we're just going to set this up so that we don't ever have to touch your old logbooks, uh, as far as anything that we do with the new engine, um, you know, airframe stuff, well, obviously we'll go in airframe stuff and propeller stuff will go in the propeller logbook, but that way, Again, hopefully 20 years or so from down the road or if something happens and you have to give up your logbook, it's just a separate logbook tied to that current remanufactured engine. So It is pretty important to keep those logbooks separate. It's not required, but it's a good idea, not only in this scenario where you need to send the logbook for the old engine back with the core, but also in the case where you've got them all mixed together, someday you're going to sell that, that airplane. And whoever's buying it is going to do a logbook inspection. 
And if the person who's doing the logbook inspection comes across a repair that, that raises eyebrows or that it is concerning, the fact that it was a repair to the old engine, which has long since been melted down by Lycoming, is not going to be immediately apparent to the person doing the logbook review. I mean, it should be if they're really good at their job, but it would, I would not want any old horror stories of, or, you know, oh, there was an oil change done in, in late 1973 by a shop that was later found out to be, you know, pencil whipping oil changes. Uh, but I'm glad that all of the records re related to the old 1968 engine are gone and I'll never see them again. And that there's no way they can sort of pollute my log books because of course that engine isn't around anymore. Right. Tracy Ligon, you wanna jump in on this discussion since you've got particular expertise? You're welcome. The reason I mentioned it is uh, we were talking about log books. The other thing is um, Kristen Winter um, who does a lot of logbook reviews as part of pre-buys did a Comanche Zoom uh, early on. It's probably in the first 10 of the series. And um, since logbooks are such an important part of our aircraft's value, I encourage people to uh, go to meetings.northeastcomanche.org and uh, listen to that. It's kind of an eye opener. Tim H., do you want to jump in? Because you had kind of a good review question that I think a lot of people have as well. Or I can ask it for you. So Tim H. was messaging, um, Will, can you break down again what parts the insurance company did agree to cover. And I realize this is kind of a massive list, but starting with the engine and then maybe going to some other stuff, would you be willing to sure. just kind of re-break down that, what the insurance company covered, what you covered, and particularly on starting with the engine? Sure. So the um, the insurance company is not going to touch the engine. And, I, and I'll, I'll cover this in, in the insurance process one as well, but the insurance company is not going to cover the engine. Um, they will cover anything that gets damaged. So like wear and tear items, um, they won't cover. So an example is they won't cover the engine, but they'll cover accessories attached to the engine that may have been damaged as a result, which is why they'll pay for an IRAN of the alternator and the vacuum pump because a sudden stoppage of those things uh, may have caused damage to those. So the engine was moving really fast, stopped, possibly damaged these two components. So because the engine failure caused those you know, those two items to possibly be damaged. They'll pay for them to get inspected and repaired as, as necessary, but they won't pay for the engine itself. They won't yeah. pay for the uh, Why won't they pay for the engine? That Adam just asked that, and I, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, so the insurance company will not pay for the engine because um, they consider the failure a result of natural wear and tear like they're not going to go into the, the engine and say okay i i tried to make this this argument and i was pretty much told that's not going to happen you, you um, can make a good parallel to car insurance here if you get in an accident and your car gets banged up they will repair for the damage but if you take if your car won't start one morning and you take it to your mechanic and he says oh yeah you, you need a new thingamajig and you got to replace this and your cylinders are bad basically you need a new engine or you need a thousand dollars to work on your engine your car insurance company doesn't have any responsibility for that that's not that's not part of it that's not part surely, of it. their insurance they're insuring you against damage in an accident they're not insurance insuring you against regular maintenance costs even if they're surprise and unusually high maintenance costs that's a good point, Malcolm. So if you're taking, if you, even if you're driving down the highway and your engine just shuts off and you go into a Jersey barrier, the insurance company's not going to say, oh, we need to replace the engine. They're going to say, we'll replace the damage. I mean, it's kind of the same reasoning, but no. I, yeah, I actually had that happen. It's not the Jersey barrier part, but I was driving a, a Volvo down the highway one day and it just stopped cold mid, mid lane, 60 miles an hour. And it was the timing belt that had broken and it had ruined the entire top of the engine. The insurance, I didn't, I didn't try to make an insurance claim, but if I had, they would have just laughed me uh, off the phone. Well, the bottom line to walk away. That wasn't an accident. Now, if I'd been smart, I would have run the car into a Jersey barrier, and then I could have had the <laughs> claim that the engine, the engine quit as a result of the crash. But because, as yeah. in your case, 
the engine quit first, not as the result of some some accident. Uh, it's not part of their responsibility. So yeah. will the will the insurance know. company pay for an engine if the engine is broken as a result of an accident rather than the yes, cause? Yes, the insurance yeah. company. If you if you have a gear up or a prop landing, strike, that's a good example. Mm. Yeah. If okay. you have a gear up landing or any prop strike, either for, from your own negligence for getting to put the gear down or from a mechanical failure that prevents you putting the gear down, then the engine will have been had a sudden stoppage because of this accident. Yeah. And that was then, worrying when, in when, those cases, you know. the insurance company will pay for removal of the engine, tear down inspection of the engine, and reinstallation of the engine only. But if there's some, if you know, if there's something uh, wrong with, yeah. if there was wear and tear to the engine already, then that's not their responsibility. Because I was and worrying when you when you mentioned that because the 400 you're paying for an engine with an airframe attached. So you know, if the engine go, if the engine is damaged on a 400, you that's almost 90 percent of the value of the plane so it was worrying to i thought if they didn't cover any engines at all you'd be a bit buggered now i if... just want to jump in here this is cj and say don't anybody get any ideas here we are trying to keep our insurance rates down and no. keep our airplanes flying for another 50 years so don't be that guy <laughs> <laughs> um, i just saw a good question in the chat window <laughs> I was, gonna add, okay. I was just going to add one thing. So, Adam, I, I did think about this when I was going through the process. I'm like, how could I possibly make this insurance company pay for this engine? And if they, if they, if they had to, they probably would have totaled the plane. Um, but, I mean, I like to make arguments. That's what I do for a living. So, I, um, I was like, you know, if, if a bearing slipped, causing a connecting rod to heat up and fail, the connecting rod's the failure. Everything else that happened naturally was the result of the failure of the connecting rods and they i mean i tried to make that to the adjuster and he's like no way he's like there's no way that's gonna that's gonna fly yeah um, in other words don't just just don't crash a 400 and then you'll be fine yeah it, it, another thing i wanted to add when someone has asked me what the insurance company would pay for one thing that um they will not pay for or the elastomeric ward engine mounts because they're considered wear and tear and they're not a result um they're wear and tear items so they won't pay for to replace those one of the benefits that you saw in the hard landing inspection, if you land in a field, is that you get the engine mount, um, you know, you get that overhaul through IRAN. And the benefit of that is I don't have to pay to remove or reinstall my engine, remove the old engine or reinstall the new engine, because what do they have to do to get to the engine mount? They have to do that anyway. So that's labor I get to piggyback on that is required, but it's saving me money because I'm not having to pay for it. And that's, of course, going to be like, what is it? I mean, what is removal and reinstallation? It's like a thousand, two thousand dollars, maybe more. Um, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, if I can, if I can add a, a war story here. In my case, uh, back about fourteen years ago, uh, I had a bolt break in the uh, landing gear, the torque link scissors bolt, uh, and as a result, the gear uh, went halfway up and would not go the rest of the way up, and also wouldn't go the rest of the way down. And so I, here I was flying a perfectly good airplane with a perfectly good engine and propeller and no way to get the gear down, uh, even an emergency extension wouldn't help. So I had to set the airplane down, um, gear up, and then I had to go through the process of making an insurance claim for it. And in this case, you know, the insurance wouldn't, re wouldn't replace the bolt that broke and caused the gear up, but they did repair the damage that resulted from the gear up. And in that case, I had an engine that had been overhauled twice and had 5,800 hours on it. It was 1,888 hours into its latest overhaul. And they said, yes, we're gonna pay for this to be removed from the airframe, torn down, uh, tear down inspection, uh, reassembled, and then put back on the airframe. And I said, uh, that doesn't seem like a very good use of that money given the age of the engine. And the insurance adjuster immediately said, oh yeah, we're paying you the cost to do that. What you do with that money is up to you. You wanna, you wanna use that money to go buy a, a remanufactured engine? Be our guest, we don't care. Most people usually do that. But in that case, the engine removal, uh, inspection and, and replacement onto the airframe was being covered because it was due to the accident. And I just used that money to have the old one removed and have the new one put on 
And then I got whatever it was, $9,000 towards the cost of the remand. Another war story. I uh, had an engine problem and the uh, was able to get it back on the airport. So I had to pay for the engine overhaul because obviously insurance wasn't gonna pay for it. I wasn't fortunate enough, you might say, to land off the airport. <laughs> If only you had landed gear up. Yes. <laughs> and uh, can you remind us, Will, there was no prop strike or correct because you had such a beautiful landing with your gear down? There was no prop strike, which was actually, uh, I was kind of happy. I mean, yeah, I was kind of happy. I was happy about that because the prop had only like 100 hours on it. Wouldn't, it was, wouldn't a I'd, prop strike have gotten you an Iran um, on the engine? It sure would have, but his prop wasn't moving. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't moving. It, it, it seemed, but, it well, seemed that's the thing. The I mean, was, the prop was pretty much horizontal. But I was trying to buy a 250 in California um, that had, had the prop struck when the plane was completely stationary, not engine running at all. It wasn't even, I didn't even have a pilot in it. It was tied down. The, the prop was nicked by an auto gyro that came loose. And even that need required a full uh, engine, uh, you know, IRAN inspection. So, uh, according to Lyco, I mean, so mm -hmm. then the insurance company will always follow the Lycoming service bulletin. So I'm just wondering if even with the engine not running, if you'd even slightly dink the prop, would it have been an IRAN inspection on the engine and kind of a couple of problems solved? I, I actually don't know. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a good hypothetical for an insurance adjuster. If, if the engine is shot and it's the propeller's windmilling and hits the ground, are they going to cover? I mean, I, I, I think the insurance company would would be in the business of not spending money they don't need to spend, and they would probably point out, "Excuse me, are you prepare? Are you proposing that we do an Iran on an engine with a great big gaping hole in the case?" <laughs> <laughs> they might you, say are that. You yeah. <laughs> yes, are you seriously yeah. going to look me in the eye and tell me that you need this engine removed and inspected <laughs> because there's not much to inspect here? I think mean, you just put the flashlight in through the hole and go, "Yep, yeah, that's but that's a." Uh... That's broken. Yeah. <laughs> Failed. <laughs> Rich Bergman had a good question. Uh, because of the fact that Lycoming has stopped uh, with the narrow decks, did they automatically send you a reman wide deck with, uh, with the STC? Yes. I, In I mean, my case, they did. I sent them no, a narrow deck core and they sent a wide deck. There's no question about it. They don't make I, narrow decks. Yeah, Except I think that's what's going to happen. No this goes back to the whole like you know the salespeople that sell at Lycoming Engines. They don't they don't, they don't really tell you, but I, I imagine it's going to be like Malcolm said. It's going to come back with with a wide deck engine. I didn't I didn't get a vote in the matter. So that is correct. Wide deck with a roller tappet technology. And Lycoming will not. Uh, will not overhaul, uh, even if you wanted to, uh, a narrow deck engine. You're gonna have That's to go correct. to Zephyr or somebody else, Penyang or somebody uh, to do that. Well, one of the questions that I have just from listening is, um, and forgive me if I was switching back and forth windows, do you have any of your leftover um, connect the lines left, right, uh, diagrams that you drew when you were trying to figure out what to have done as piggyback work? Because I thought that was a brilliant image and it might help the rest of us even as a method to use when we go into, you know, for example, annual. I didn't actually, I mean, I'll admit I didn't actually do that. That's just how I saw it like mentally when I was trying to make things, make things work. I mean, I, I didn't, that's how, that's the best way I could explain it, but I didn't actually go through the process. In hindsight, that's what I would do. <laughs> the time in Prague, Czechia is 2.39 a.m. Hey, Terry, you're hot micing. Mr. Lindsay, hmm? We're, you're hot micing. We heard the time in Prague. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's that time here in Germany, too. Watch this, everybody. It's 1.40 in the UK. turn on music at volume 10. Is this the easy way to make your wife come down and tell you to shush? <laughs> no, that, the idea was it was going to turn on everyone's Alexa who's listening. Oh, one of the uh, oh, one of the questions I saw in the chat was the um, 
the difference between the 275 and the G5. I know there's a, there's a Comanche zoom on here about that. Um, I think the G5 is a, is a couple thousand dollars cheaper than a 275. CJ, yeah. wrong. I actually just put the autopilot update together and, um, the answer is, and so I was literally just pulling up those prices. Um, you cannot use the bottom of the line G5, I think, to drive the Garmin autopilot. And so oh. if I recall, yeah, uh, there's actually several, several bottles. So that you, if you're going to put in a Garmin, you've got to have either a G5 or a GI275. I mentioned that only because the prices that I'm going to quote are for um, the ones that can drive an autopilot, just because I'm assuming that's what you'd want. And I think I'm just going to use one of the installers installed prices. It was three, about 3000 for the G5s and about 4000 for the GI275s installed from Lafayette Electronics. I, uh, I should double check. It might be 5000 installed for the GI275. We're getting quoted £6,500 to fit twice 275s here. Oh, my Lord. Well, they are booked out until 2022, so maybe that's why. Um, Adam, one thing that, Adam, everything one thing is more expensive in England. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think I'm, why do you think I'm desperately trying to it. get on a flight? <laughs> yeah. When they send uh, it from the U.S. to Britain, they put a T tax on it. <laughs> oh. I actually, I do want to jump in because Garmin, after one of our Comanche Zooms, was kind enough to custom write a Comanche FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions document. And separately, they put together a G5 versus GI275 comparison document that's posted in meetings.northeastcomanche.org under the Garmin um, Comanche Zoom. And that is worth looking at. It gives the features list for the two devices along with a little bit about why Garmin created both of them. One or the other is required if you're gonna put in a Garmin uh, GFC 500. That's, that's what I have an eye towards. That's why I was trying to go towards one of those. I, and I, I looked at an Aspen, but I mean, I just, a lot of this is like your, it seems based on everything I could research on Aspen systems, the G5, the 275, it seems to be a lot of personal preference. I mean, I think yeah. you're, you're going to be well equipped regardless of what you pick. I feel more comfortable with the, the failure modes in the Garmin over the Aspen. And I like the idea that the, the, uh, the G5 has been in production for a number of years and there's a ton of shops out there that have been putting them in. So um, you have to be a Garmin dealer to install, to install a 275. So if, if you're looking at a shop trying to get 275, that's a consideration. You don't have to be one for a G5. Um, and did yeah, you that, consider that, flush mounting the G5? I, I'm not going to do a flush mount. I'm trying to do as little invasive panel work as possible. That's that's my goal. That's interesting that you said the G5 had been in production for quite a few years. Aspen's been in production almost five times as long as that thing's been out. I was going to say, exactly. Oh, sorry. I, I was trying to draw the comparison between the 275 and the, and the G5. Oh, okay. I just I just don't like the, the failure modes I've seen in the Aspen. That's what kind of put me off from that. What what is um, the failure mode that puts you off on the Aspen? Because I, you know, we have we see aircraft of Aspens quite often. What what I've seen is the the X across the entire display. That's not mm. there's no reversionary mode. Whereas if I lose one G five, I have a like if I'm in IMC, I have a second that I can use as a backup attitude indicator. I know that red X because I had an Aspen equipped um, Cirrus do that to me. <laughs> But I think it's all personal preference. I mean, it's it's whatever you're comfortable with. I would. I wish we could have the the Dynon um, autopilot because the Skyview HDX is a lovely bit of kit with synthetic vision as well, and much cheaper than G3X. Still pretty expensive though. <laughs> yeah, and you start once you start adding all the subcomponents in there, it, uh, it, the price creeps up pretty quick. Yeah, it doesn't take long. The, um, I'll jump in just briefly to say that uh, Garmin, uh, so the G5s and GI275s obviously will work brilliantly with the GFC 500. 
um, and any of the autopilots actually. So the formal approval and certification for the TRIO Pro Pilot is being done actually simultaneously with the Comanche single submission for the Pro Pilot. Some of the advantages of the STEC 3100 and the Pro Pilot is if you wanna keep your steam gauges, then those will both work nicely with, uh, with your original steam gauges. Whereas with the garments, you do have to have the G5 or the GI275 installed, just one. You don't need you don't need both, but people are going to both if they want to get rid of their vacuum systems. Um, and then uh, Eric Jones had a rather spectacular failure mode on his Garmin. Uh, maybe you've all seen the video where he was taking off, and I think he was going into IMC, and literally his display started flashing at him, and I think turning upside down. <laughs> so um, there, you know. It's, did he put the video on Facebook for that? He did. Yeah, and he if did. You search, mm -hmm. It was terrifying. I'm going to go and have a look. Yeah. So it was years ago. I think it was, what, two years ago, Malcolm? I don't know if you can go back that far in the Facebook group. Yeah, I don't. One of the Adelis. Um, well, I have to say I learned a ton about ways of thinking about restorations as well as insurance recovery. Will, I'm so grateful that you have put this together for us in uh, such a systematic way. I, we were talking about this last night. You said it's the army training and it makes me just want to go back through it myself because it's brilliant. Thank you for being here. Sure. I've made a lot of mistakes and hopefully you guys can learn from <laughs> everything that I've been going through. Yep. Oh, I do just want to mention to everybody, um, if on schedule, Matt Kirk, who's going to be helping Will to look over his newly <laughs> reassembled Comanche, had back surgery. Um, and so he is uh, probably pretty doped up still. But uh, if you all want to send him well wishes, if you could, you can either throw him into the chat window or send a text and I'll screen capture them all and just shoot them all over to him if you want. So it's an option. If not, write him a card. He is one of the most critical people keeping our airplanes flying. Um, he's ComancheGear.com. And uh, Matt Kirk, uh, the folks at Webco, um, Hans Newbert, Kristen Winters, Zach Grant, um, are just some of the people who have given so much um, volunteer and, and not volunteer time to us. But we would not be still flying, I don't think, without them. So. I figured I'd just drop a note in there and uh, happy birthday tomorrow to Hank Spellman, another one that's um, acted as a um, kind of an ombudsman and a parliamentarian for many years while the ICS was our functioning type support organization. So thank you for your service, Hank, and happy birthday. I think we put Hank. <laughs> I think at this point, I'm gonna uh, end the recording because we're done. I think we're pretty well done with this topic. The, the Zoom will stay on so you can keep talking, but the, uh, the recording will be stopping. Yeah. Um, Good night for me.